Good evening, everyone. Oh, yeah, there it is. Everybody awake now? I'll do that again later just to wake you up. Love you. I'm not saying names because you're going to be on the old internet later. So, how's everybody doing? Having a good week? Are you ready for encounter? Yeah, that is what I love to hear so much. All right, so tonight we are in the middle of our series called Do Hard Things. And in our first night, we heard from our very own Isaac Sladen talking about how to do stuff, hard things that is outside of your comfort zone. And that's a challenge for even me. There's sometimes that I'm just like, I don't want to do that. And my wife goes, well, I don't. I'm like, I have to. And then we heard from Ethan Ormsby, one of our residents, And he talked about doing the small hard things that aren't visible, but are important. And his big illustration, does anybody remember what it was? Ants. There it is, ants. So tonight, we are going to talk about doing more. Everybody say, do more with me. Do more. And you're like, where's that found in the Bible? I'm so glad you asked. We're going to talk about that. So a few years ago, I don't anymore, but I used to teach in a college setting. And just so you know, um, I'm like, I'm one of those people, like even at your age, I liked school. I like learning. I liked learning. I enjoyed school. One of my parents pulled me out to homeschool me. Yes, I was homeschooled. Everybody that's homeschooled, give me a homeschool high five. And in elementary school, I was actually in private school and I, I loved it. I thrived on the competition. And then they pulled me out and I still liked it, but it was just a little bit different. And I did great. My grades were great. It was beautiful. And then I went to college. And I would love to tell you that I did well, but I didn't. I was like not a good student. I was a little distracted because I like this redheaded girl. It's not her fault. I'm not blaming her. Don't you dare tell her that. We eventually got married and then my grades got better. It was kind of cool. Eventually, I worked on a master's and I did well again. But when I taught college and when I was in school, my understanding was that an A was excellent. You had done everything you were supposed to. If you got a B, it was like, good. If you got a C, everybody knows, like, average. If you got a D, it was like, ooh, man, you just barely escaped. You might have to take that class over again if it's a part of your major. If it's not, eh, we'll see. And if you had an F, you just failed. And I I would love to tell you that I've never had an F in a class. I've actually had one. I got to take a class over. And I could make up all kinds of excuses, but I had to take a class over. I did not love that. I didn't get another F. That was in college. When I started teaching, like at the college level, one of my students one time said, so what do I have to do to pass this class? I said, what do you mean, what do you have to do? Like, you should be aiming for the, the best, right? You should go for A, excellent, do more. And, and I said, well, here's where you are. And I helped them out. And then I heard them say to one of their friends, you know, D's get degrees. And I'm like, oh, what a horrible mentality. And I have heard that many times since. And I've actually talked to some of the people in the room who've been through college and they said, yeah, I've heard that before. I don't love that attitude. And I can tell you who else doesn't love that attitude. Jesus does not love that attitude. Because what it says is, I'm going to do barely enough to get by, to make it so that I don't have to do that again. And that is not how we are called to live. We are called to live what the Bible says is an abundant life. And here's the challenge for both you and me. We sometimes get complacent. That means we get lazy. We're like, I'm doing good. I'm coasting along. I'm like, I'm I'm near the top of my class, but I'm not at the top of the class and I don't have to really try very hard. And that will get you in trouble. And I have a clip that I'm gonna set up. You don't, go, don't play it yet. But there, there is a young man who a few years ago ran in a race. Now, some of you may know I like to run. I don't run as fast as I used to for a lot of reasons. How many of you in this room say, I like to run? I enjoy it. Okay, I see those hands. I appreciate that. So this young man is a fast runner. Very good runner, as a matter of fact. But here's the problem. He got a little complacent, okay? We have an eight-second clip. I want you to watch this and pay very close attention to what you're about to see. Here he goes, running along, and if you look, he's celebrating. He's like, yeah, yay it up for me. And what happened? Anybody see what happened? 
while he's going, yeah, guys, I'm going to win the race. This is awesome. I'm doing so good. What happened? Do you see it? He got second place. He lost because he was so busy celebrating the win that hadn't happened yet that he got passed by a person who was willing to do more and wasn't going to stop and celebrate until the race was over. Do you see that? You are called to do more. And here is the heart of the issue for us, okay? It, it, it could be very easy for me to give you this instruction tonight and like sound like a dad, which I am. And it could just be, you should try your best. You should do better. You need to do more. And there's something out there that you can go look this up later. It's called uh, therapeutic moral deism. The idea is you should behave and believe in God and life is gonna be amazing for you if you just be a good person. And that is not what I am here to preach to you tonight. I want you to understand the word of God. And the word of God says that we have been given both a great command and a great commission. And the great command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We summarize that here at High Street by talking about loving God and serving people. The next element that's the great commission that we are called to do is we talk about that in reach the world, which is our purpose as a church. And that great commission says, share the gospel with people who have never heard about Jesus. The good news that Jesus came, he died on a cross, he was raised from the dead, his death paid for our sin, and his life again gives us hope for life eternal. And so you have the great command and the great commission. And so when we do these things, we are doing them to be obedient to the God who created us, not just because it's the right thing to do, because ultimately that will cause all of us to just stop. So we're going to talk about three ways that we can do more. And I'm going to tell you about this repeatedly. So by the time the night is over, I hope you will remember. First of all, we should do more when we are asked to. Sometimes we're asked to do more. And we should do more than we've been asked to do. That's really something that's important for you to think about. Do more than you've been asked to do. You should also do more than you're expected to do. How many of you have some expectations in your home that you know, this is what I'm supposed to do? Got to clean my room. Uh, Got to clean my bathroom. Maybe on a schedule with somebody else. I have some family chores. You have part of your responsibility as a householder or living with somebody is you have to do some chores. And then sometimes, and this is a hard one, you have to do more and maybe that person doesn't deserve it. And you're like, I'm going to do more for somebody who doesn't deserve it. So let's talk about do more even than is asked, okay? Jesus gives this instruction, and it's in the middle of a conversation about how people treat us and how we should respond when they don't always treat us nicely. And I'm going to give you a little history. Can you handle a history lesson for like 30 seconds? I got some yeses, so I'm going to run with it. 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire was in charge of the known world where Jesus lived. They brought great peace. But one of the things they brought along with that peace and really good roads was this requirement that if a soldier asked somebody who was a commoner to carry their stuff, that it was literally a requirement that they do so for a mile. And their mile was just about as long as our mile. So think about this. You're going along, you're doing your, your daily business, whatever you have to do. And all of a sudden you see a soldier. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go over here and try to get away. And you don't make it. And they go, hey, you, you got to carry my stuff. Because they didn't want to. And here's what Jesus, and you had to, like you couldn't get out of it. There was, there was no way, you'd be in trouble. They would go literally throw you into prison for a bit. So Jesus said, hey, I know when you are told to do this, I want you to do more than you were asked because you have to go the mile. He said, what I want you to do is go a second mile. Now run through the thought of the math with this me for just a second. Uh, it takes most of us, if you're walking at a leisurely pace, which you would do when you're carrying a bunch of armor, about 20 minutes to go a mile. So if you're 20 minutes out of your way, you got to come back 20 minutes because it's probably not going your way. So you've lost 40 minutes of your day and your life. And what Jesus says is, hey, be willing to lose 80. Now, he does not talk about this in the text. He basically just says, 
do it because I told you to, and you're called to be perfect like I am perfect. And that's kind of like, wow, I'm not perfect, but Jesus says that you should behave well so that you can be viewed well. Now, I will tell you, if you do something like this today as a student, and somebody says, hey, can you help me? And you go, yeah, I'll bring it all the way to your car for you. And they're like, I just asked you to bring it to the room. They're going to probably ask you, you will have a conversation. Why did you do that? And here's your chance. Remember, what drives us? The great command of God, right? Love your God who created you, love your neighbor, and the great commission. So when they say, why did you do that? You could say, well, I just felt like it. I was just a good person. I was trying to be nice. Or you could remember why you're here on this planet and say, "Um, actually, I'm doing this because Jesus, my Lord and Savior, said that we actually are supposed to go extra and do more for people. And so I'm I'm serving you because Jesus said I should. And they're going to go, you what? Explain that to me. And that will give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Sometimes you should do more than is expected. This next video that I have for you is, I actually found it by accident when I was hunting for the other one. And I was just blown away. Again, I'm a runner. I've run some pretty long races. I've never seen what we're about to watch happen before. But it moved me. And I'm afraid some of you are going to laugh. I want you to understand that when you run, it is a taxing activity. I have gone on runs before and gotten two or three miles away from the house and had to literally sit down. I had to do this, sit down, because it was either sit down or fall down, and my world got really narrow. You ever had that happen, runners out there? You got like a little bit of a blackout, a tunnel vision, you're like, and I had to sit there. And I thought, man, I don't want to call my wife. She's going to say, I told you not to run today because it's so hot outside, and you probably didn't drink enough water, and I, I didn't, and I made it back home. Go ahead and play the video for me, and I'm going to walk you through this. So this is a race in Kenya. This is a 10K, which is a pretty good, decent distance. And you'll notice this man is stumbling. And then he can't get back up. Now, your body shuts down when there are problems, like you haven't had enough fluid, you haven't had enough what's called glycogen, you haven't had enough food of the right variety to make it possible. And you'll notice people keep running by him. They just keep going. They're like, man, now it stinks to be you. I'm going to keep going because I have a chance. And you'll notice he's trying so hard. He's crawling and rolling and doing everything he can to make it. And everybody just keeps going by because their place in the race is going to be diminished, except for this guy. He stops. He literally picks him up and helps him all the way across the finish line. And then he's done, but he lost his place. And if you know anything about races, races aren't always based on who actually crosses the finish line first in order, because they use these little things called chips in your shoes. So you could be like the 50th person to start, but actually have your time ahead of everybody who's in front of you. That's actually a fun way to run a race, because you're always passing people, and you're just getting further and further ahead of them. You're already ahead of them. That was a very kind thing of that man to do. He lost place, but he remembered his purpose as a person. And that was do even things that aren't expected of you. Do more than is expected of you. It was not expected of him to help this man, but he did. This kind of activity happens in the Bible. Paul traveled all over what we call the Mediterranean. And one of the places he went to is called Macedonia. And when he was there, he said, hey, I know you guys are struggling financially, but there's other church in Corinth. They have nothing. And I'm going to ask you to give. And they did. This church in Macedonia gave. 2 Corinthians 8.3 says, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but hear this, far more. They went beyond what was expected. And they did it of their own free will. Nobody made them. Nobody said, hey, you should do this. They did it because they wanted to. They wanted to help. Nobody forced them. Next, do more, even when the other person doesn't deserve it. I was the recipient of something like this one time, and it was really cool. Many years ago, before my wife and I lived here in Springfield, we got to go to a, uh, a show, like not a Branson show, like we're talking kind of like a Broadway show, except for it was in Boston. 
and I had bought tickets and they were expensive and I'm like, I don't know how this is going to play out. And we went to see a, a show called Anna and the King, which is like the King and I, but the next iteration. It was a lot of fun. But we get there and they tell us where we're supposed to go. And if you know my wife, she does not like heights. Well, I didn't know that the seats I could afford were not at the balcony level. They were at the second balcony level. So you, you climb up these really narrow stairs, more like a ladder, and you climb. And she's looking at me like, what? have you put me into? I thought, oh no, this was a, I did the wrong thing. And so we get up there and then you sit and I'm not kidding. You ever heard of the nosebleed seats? We were in them. I was like, um, you going to be okay? She said, no. And so I said, stay here, close your eyes, wait for me. I went back down, all the way back down, and I went and I found the box office. That's the place where you buy tickets, if you didn't know that. And I showed the man my tickets, and I said, hey, um, sir, I, I bought tickets not understanding how this all worked. It's my first time. Um, I'm willing to pay whatever it takes. Can you get me better seats than this? And this very kind man who probably looked at me and said, yeah, you didn't know what you're doing, and I didn't. He handed me a piece of paper, and he said, Go talk to that guy over there. So I went back up, got my wife, came back down, and I handed the piece of paper to this man. And he goes, oh, step right this way, sir. And he brought us to the second row. Yeah, some of you are like, man, I know what theater's all about. That's insane. We're talking hundreds of dollars, and this is 20-something years ago. And I was like, uh, wow. This is amazing. Like you could see the eyeballs of the people that were on the stage and all kinds of stuff. You could not see that from way up in the nosebleed seats. You know what I experienced that day? Somebody did more than was deserved. I didn't deserve that. I'd paid for a ticket in the cheap seats, but I got the good seats that day. God was kind to me in my ignorance and in the word of God, Ephesians 1.19 says, Paul says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. So when you try to do more, you, you don't have to do it on your own. As a matter of fact, you can't do it on your own. You ought to be relying on the power of God. That's how you can do more. Now, some of you go, okay, you know, movie theater seats, not movie, regular theater seats running. I don't, that's none of, I don't care about that. Maybe, but I do know that you all live somewhere where probably you're expected to clean your room. And when you are asked to clean your room, maybe you should just do a little more than you're asked. And I don't know, vacuum it after you've removed the layer of wall-to-wall -wall, uh, carpeting that you have in the form of your clothes. <clears throat> Nobody does that, do they? I did when I was your age. My parents came in one day and they were like, um, where's your floor? It's under there somewhere. And eventually I mostly grew out of that. If your job at home is to empty the dishwasher, maybe more than just putting them away, you can go, hey, you know, I noticed these counters are a little dirty and the sink is kind of a mess because I didn't rinse it out after I got my dishes and did the stuff. Maybe you could like do that. That's doing just a little more than you are asked to do. Maybe if your job is to take the trash to the street, and this is like simple stuff, but I promise you if you do this, your parents are gonna go, um, who are you and what have you done with my child? Promise, they're gonna do that. So if it's your job to take the trash to the street, maybe you go around like to all the bedrooms and the bathrooms and you get that trash and you bring it to the street too and you put the extra bags back in where they belong. Your parents are gonna be like, are you sick? What do you want? Yeah, I don't want anything. I'm just trying to do a little more than I was asked to do to serve you so that I can be an example of Jesus. And if your parents aren't believers, this is a great way to have a gospel conversation. Maybe you have a friend who says, can you help me study? And you go, yeah. And rather than the 15 minutes you're willing to give them because sometimes you're a little annoyed by them, you actually give them a couple of hours and you're legitimately helping them study. You should also do more than is expected. Now, here's an interesting thing. Sometimes in the world of church, we're very much fixated on, well, they don't. 
they don't smoke, and they don't drink, and they don't say bad words, and they're not sleeping around, oh, they're a good person. That's called negative purity. You're not necessarily doing anything good. You're just not doing anything bad. And that's good, but it's not enough. You should be defined by what you do more than by what you don't do. And God is calling you to be a witness and to live life for him. Sometimes we're called to do more even when the other person doesn't deserve it. Make friends with strangers. Be kind to the person who's making your coffee who looks cranky. When you become a driver, and this happened to me on the way here. If you drive in Springfield, you'll have this opportunity on a daily basis. Rather than getting upset that the man in front of you with a big long trailer cut over and swung back, which happened on my way here, I kind of moved to get away from him. And as I passed him, literally, he looked at me and he goes, I could tell he felt bad. I was like, hey, I I wasn't even mad, and it wasn't anything to do with preaching this message. He was trying to get out of the way of a bus, so it's good. But be kind. Like, even to the people who aren't kind, be kind. Do more, even when they don't deserve it. And this one's going to be a hard one. You have people in your life, not strangers. This is the people that are in the next bedroom. This is the people that are upstairs. This is the people that are in your class at school. This is the people that you see all the time because you have to. And you, you struggle with that because you are often disrespect, disrespected or demeaned and you don't like it. Be respectful anyway. Why? Because Jesus told you to. And when Jesus was disrespected at the end of his life, right before he was crucified, they threw all kinds of things at him. They called him names. They asked him ridiculous questions. And you know what he did? He stayed quiet. That's hard for some of you. You want to talk back. You want to give lip. You want to throw it at him. Just be quiet. That would be a win. And that would be more than the other person deserves. Now, how can you do that? Well, first of all, you cannot do this alone. If you go out there and go, I'm going to be a nice person so I can be a nice person, you will fail. You don't have the ability. You don't have the power. You're not that nice. I know. I've talked to some of you. You can get sassy in a hurry. And some of you are like, yeah, that's me. So how are you going to do it? Paul to the church in Ephesus, he says this, now, all glory to God, who is able, listen to this, through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more. When we were preparing for uh, the message tonight and we we're talking about everything before, somebody said, well, it's gonna be to infinity and beyond. I said, actually, that's a part of my message. I'm like, really? Yeah, because what does it say? God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us. That's at work within you. Say, God is at work in me. Everybody say it. There it is. To accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. You hear that more? And it's more than you ask or more than you think. Paul reminds us, back over in the book of Corinthians, and that's where we are tonight, Ephesians and Corinthians. Second Corinthians 4, 17, he says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. We will have trouble. Jesus promised that. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, and that's what we tend to do, right? We're like, oh, this is a bad thing. Oh, my car broke down. Oh, I lost my shoes. Oh, I lost my ring. Somebody I know lost their ring. It's not a good deal. Oh, I lost some money. Oh, it was an engagement ring. That's kind of bad. And I would give you more, but then I'm giving away too much information, and it's not my story to tell. So back to what you need to hear. We're looking, and all we see is the trouble. What does Paul tell us? What does he encourage us to do? 
He says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Some of you are drivers. Some of you hope to be drivers. Some of you have been driving a long time. When you are driving, there's this little thing that happens, and you get fixated on something. And you, you can actually go read news articles about this. Why did you hit the tree? Well, I didn't want to hit the tree, but that's all I could see. And people tend, it's okay to laugh. I mean, it's not your tree or your car. It's okay, you can laugh. Why did you hit the tree? It's all I could see. They looked at the tree, the thing they didn't want to hit, and that's exactly how, and they totaled their car. We tend to aim for and move toward what we are fixing our gaze on. What is it that you are fixing your gaze on? What is it that you spend your time and effort and energy looking at? Is it good and godly and right? Or is it against God and destructive and hurtful and will bring you to a path of death? I don't know, but the Holy Spirit knows and you do too. You should be fixing your eyes on the prize. That's what Paul tells us to do. So how do we do that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. He tells us, Again, in 2 Corinthians, we now have this light shining in our hearts. And I have a little light for you. And some of you go, oh, I wondered what that was all about. Here we go. I'm going to try to plug it in. All right. Everybody look up here. Can you see? You're like, I don't want to look. Whoa. We have what? What does it say? We have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. Y'all know what a, a clay jar is? Anybody ever dropped a clay jar before? What happens? <laughs> Just shatters. It breaks apart. And God says, you're a clay jar. You each are a clay jar. And here's the thing. He puts his light inside of you and eventually something will happen and you will be broken. I tried to break a clay jar and put it back together again, which is why my hands are covered with super glue right now. It didn't work, but I'm here to tell you, it's really hard to put a clay jar back together, but when you do, there's all these cracks. And you know what happens when you put the light inside the jar? The light shines through, but it only shines through the cracks. Think about that for a second. This makes it clear. You're the clay jar. You're fragile. You're easily broken. You are broken. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So if you are experiencing hurt, God can heal you. If you have had anxiety, he can give you peace. If you are experiencing and know fear, like you have fear, he will give you courage. If your struggle is anger, he can help you be calm. If you have pride, he can help you have humility. If you're experiencing addiction, he can give you community. If you've been abandoned, he can help you to see how you're embraced in Christ and the church. If you are unloved or feel unloved, you will be loved. And if you are broken, you can be made whole. You see, Jesus is more than he is these things, but he is more than a good example and our instructor. He is both of those things, but he is so much more because he is the son of God who came to take away the sin of the world. He is the only one who can pay the price for the sin that separates you from the God who created you. And here's the cool thing. We've talked about how you should do more than has been asked of you, than is expected of you. You should do more even when the other person doesn't deserve it. And the only way you can do that is through the power of God. And when you do, his light will shine through you. And when you do these things, you are like the God who made you because God will do what we ask him to do and he does more. When we ask God to work, Jesus says that everything we ask God to do, he will do. And God does more than we expect. Ephesians 3.20 now, all glory to God. Here, listen to it, because this is not the first time I've read this verse to you tonight. Who is able 
through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God who is at work in you can do more than you expect. You can only do more than is expected because God can do more than is expected. And he's willing to do that through you if you will let him. And then last but not least, God does more than we deserve. Romans 5.8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You see, we made the bond be broken by sinning against God. We brought trouble upon ourselves. We broke the relationship and God said, I can take care of this. You cannot clean yourself up, but I can do it. So if you are a believer in the room tonight, you should do more than you are asked. You should do more than is expected. You should do more than others deserve. And I want you to think about this. You're gonna be one of those two runners. Remember them? The first one was like, oh, look at me. I'm amazing. This is awesome. And you're gonna get passed because you got complacent. You're just floating along in life thinking everything's gonna go your way. And then all of a sudden it doesn't. I didn't show you the clip, but at the end, he literally lays down. He knew what he did. He'll never do that again. Or will you be like the other runner who in the face of the chance to win the prize or help this man who has fallen and is trying to move, he stops. You can tell he doesn't even hesitate. If you go back and watch the clip, he's like, oh, he's fallen down. I'm going to help him. Like, there's not even a thought. I will help him. And what you don't know, because there was no audio, is this man, his name is Simone Cheprat. He's a famous Kenyan runner. The announcers are like, that's Simone Cheprat. They couldn't believe that he stopped because he had an opportunity to win. And here's the cool thing. He had no idea what the end would be. He just knew he was going to do more, more than was expected. Nobody expects you to stop in a race and help somebody up. After that race was over, after everything transpired, they gave him a $10,000 prize. He didn't do it for the prize. God will reward you, but you shouldn't do it for that reward of money. You should do it for the reward of pleasing him. And the reward ultimately that we experience is eternity with the God who made us. So I'm not going to turn the light back on on you. You're welcome. Do you have that light in your life? Do you let that light shine out? Sometimes we do like Jesus talked about. We have a light and we put it under a, like it's called a bushel in the translation I grew up hearing. It's like you put it under that cover and you don't let anybody see. It's like putting a basket over a light. It's really hard to see anything if you've covered up that light. And that is not what we are called to do. Do you let the light shine that is in you even though you are fragile? Because that is what God wants to do. And the cracks from your brokenness, that's how the light gets out actually. So when you say, yes, I've struggled with addiction or I've struggled with anxiety or I've struggled with anger, but God is at work in me, you give hope to the people around you who have that same challenge and they say, maybe there's hope for me too but you're always pointing them back to Christ. So tonight, there, there are two types of people in this room. There's probably more, but we're gonna talk about two types of people in this room. Some of you have the light in your life and maybe you're letting it shine, maybe you're not, but you have the light. And my question for you is, will you let your light shine so that other people will see that Jesus is in your life and he is your Lord and he is your savior and he is the one who determines how you live so much so that you will share Jesus with them? And if that's you, when we have our invitation time tonight, I'm gonna ask you to come up and I want you to think about one person you know who does not have that light in their life because they do not have Jesus in their life. And I want you to come and pray with a leader for that person to come to know the light of Jesus. There's a second type of person in the room tonight. 
And that person says, I have no light. I'm not even sure what you're talking about, but I know I have sin and I know I need help and I know I don't like the way things are going right now and I want to learn more about this person, Jesus, that you've talked about, who is the perfect son of God, who is the only one who will ever give you the kind of peace that makes it possible for you to rest in the middle of all kinds of craziness. If you have no light in your life, then you need Jesus. That's the only way that God brings light to your world. Will you ask God to shine his light in your heart? In John 1, 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. The light from Jesus never goes out. And the giving that we've talked about tonight is something we can do because God himself gave his son in order that we can have eternal life. And this is what John 3, 16 says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I'm gonna ask you all to bow your heads. And remember, there's two steps. If you're, if you're a person who has the light, after we're done, I'm gonna ask you to come forward and pray with one of our leaders. I'm gonna ask our leaders to come on up now. But this moment is for those of you who say, I have no light in my life. So I'm gonna ask if you are willing to acknowledge, I have no light in my life, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to call on the name of Jesus. If you would just slip your hand up and say, I don't have light in my life. My life is a dark place and I, I need to know who Jesus is. And if that's you, pray, pray this with me. God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And I ask that you would save me through Jesus and his work on the cross. I pray that you would let his light shine in my heart that you would rescue me and that you would use me to bring hope to others so they can learn about who Jesus is. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, go ahead and stand up. And those of you who say, I have a friend who does not know Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to come forward and be bold. And maybe you even invite them to come to encounter. It's not too late. You can do that. And if you don't have a friend that you're praying about, then you need to get it find some friends. Thank you all. You've been amazing.